when we come to the New Testament, it's interesting. In the New Testament, the most mentioned sin is the word porneia. And porneia can be defined, and I'll read to you the definition from Thayer, the uh, Greek lexicographer, as he said, porneia, or what we translate in our Bibles as fornication, is to give oneself to fulfillment of sexual desires in an unlawful way. Twelve times in the scriptures, more than any other uh, sin mentioned in the New Testament is that word porneia. And what's amazing is in these 21 lists, it comes up first time, first in all the lists, more times than any other word. Porneia is most often mentioned, it's most often the number one sin mentioned in all these lists, and it's most often the number two also. If it doesn't show up as number one, it comes in second place most often. Thus we find in the scriptures that sin is very specifically listed. If we were to give the top ten sins from the scripture, number one would be sexual sin, porneia. And then in second place, tied, would be blasphemy, murder, and idolatry. In third place is covetousness. Fourth place is also a tie between malicious, envy, debaters, and disobedient. Especially disobedient, as it says in one passage, to parents. Right up there in the top four of all the sins mentioned. Then the fifth place, and there are several that are tied for this with multiple mentions, are drunkenness, wrathfulness, witchcraft, or pharmakeia with that drug overtone, lasciviousness, which is that moral excess, evil longings, which you see often in our Bibles as concupiscence, and lying. Well, I was reading this afternoon also a book that has blessed many a heart, thousands of people through the years. It was written in 1950 by a fellow named Roy Hessian. It was called The Calvary Road. It was written to Christians who perhaps are not having trouble with emulations and seditions and variance and murder, we have trouble with some other things, and I like what he wrote. Page 18 of the Calvary Road, he said, Anything that springs from self, however, small as it may be, be it self-energy, self-complacency and service, they are sin. Self-pity and trials or difficulties, self-seeking in business or Christian work, self-indulgence in one's spare time, sensitivity oversensitiveness or touchiness or resentment or self-defense when we are hurt or injured by others or self-consciousness or reserve or worry or fear all spring from self and all are sin. And again on page 14 of the same book he gets right down to business as he says it is self too who is often doing Christian work. Perhaps we don't have very many people here involved in pornea, but we have many people that might be doing their work for the Lord actually for themselves or for someone else other than Him. It's always self, I continue quoting, who gets irritable, envious, resentful, that is critical, and worried. It is self that is hard, unyielding in its attitude to others. It's self who is shy and self-conscious, being broken by God is a work that God does and also ours. And the only way to overcome self and the sins that are enumerated so often in scriptures is to allow God to bring his pressures to bear, but we have to make the choice. Hessian concludes by saying, God will show us the expressions of this proud hard self that cause him pain. But brokenness in daily experience is simply the response of humility to the conviction of God. Let me read to you another facet, and if you want to follow along in 1 Corinthians 13, I want to remind you of another area that we must deal with when we talk about victory, because there is sin in having a lack of love in our lives. And Paul's monumental extolling of love beginning in verse 4 as you follow along I could perhaps add to it a little bit because 
If we are to have continuous victory in our lives and victorious Christian living, not only must we say no to the sins of the flesh and to the sins of speech and to the sins of selfishness, but we have to say no to them even in the most intimate of settings, which of course would be in our homes. If we want to have revival, it has to start in the quietness of our own heart and in the quietness of our homes. But we could translate what Paul said is, love is long-suffering, it's patient, it's kind. It doesn't boast, it isn't conceited. Love is not rude, love is not selfish. Love just won't get irritated. We know that there's sin and self involved when love can be irritated. Love doesn't entertain unkind thoughts about another. And on and on we could go because it doesn't, verse 5, act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own, seeking after its own things. It's not provoked. It doesn't take into account wrong suffered. It doesn't keep a list and say, well, you got me then and I'll get you later. But rather, it will refuse, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 13, to rejoice in unrighteousness. It won't say, yes, they got what they deserved. It will also rejoice in the truth. It will find some truth to, to raise high. It will bear all things. It will believe all things. It will hope against hope, and it will endure to the end. So the scriptures say that sin is when we don't allow love to reign in our lives. The songwriter put it this way, if we want to have victory over sin, we have to say, Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in thee, that it might be no more I, dear Lord, but Christ that lives with me. But where do we start? We know all these things. We've heard sermons on sin and we've We've dealt with sin in our lives, but where do we start? Well, we know Christ, and Christ was manifest to take away sin, right? That's what John 1.29 says. That's what 1 John 3, verse 5 says. And we know that he was come to destroy the works of the devil. We know that. Christ's blood redeems us from sin, Ephesians 1.7. Christ's blood cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1.7. We have been made free from sin, Romans 6.18 tells us. We are dead to sin, Romans 6.2, and again in verse 11. 1 Peter 2.24 tells us that. As Christians, we profess to have ceased from sin, 1 Peter 4.1. We are no longer continuing unabated in sin. We're ashamed when we commit sin, Romans 6.21. We abhor ourselves on account of sin as Job did in Job 42 6 when he saw the Lord he says I abhor my sinfulness the fear of God is that which restrains us from sin Proverbs 16 tells us the word of God keeps us from sin right Psalm 119 9 through 11 how can we keep our ways pure by taking heed to God's word the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin John 16 8 and 9 tells us that. When he's come, he'll reprove us of sin. We know all these things. If we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves, 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we haven't sinned, we make God a liar, verse 10. And you know, what's so interesting is Daniel put it in his prayer in Daniel 9. He says, confusion of face belongs to us when we sin. In other words, we have the image of God, we have borne his spirit upon us as he's transformed our lives and as we continue committing sin it makes confusion of face because we're supposed to bear his image not the image of the world but where do we start if we're going to have victorious christian living and let's start in romans 13 tonight and i just want to be very practical and very brief and say some things that we know all of us but just remind us of them and perhaps commit ourselves anew and afresh to some things we know. But Romans 13, verse 11, I like this, and there are a multitude of places that we could start in our study tonight. 
but I think Romans 13 hits it on the nose because there's no more monumental treatment of doctrine in the Scripture than Romans. And Paul starts in chapter 1 talking about the decadence and the fallenness of man and Israel's complete guilt before God and, and how God operates. And he talks about how to overcome sin in a very specific way in 6, 7, and 8. But look at Romans 11, or chapter 13, verses 11 down to 14, and I'll read it to you. And this do, after all this, after 12 chapters, and now halfway into the 13th chapter of, of solid doctrine, he said, in this do, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. And he's talking to first century Christians, mind you, that have the apostles around. And he said, you're starting to fall asleep already. You're not paying attention. He says, wake up. And take notice, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Wow. He'd only known the Lord. He's writing this about the year 56. The Lord had just, in the A.D. 30, just 26 years before, had ascended to glory. He said, our salvation, our... And what he's talking about is the fact of God's coming. He said, that's closer than when we believed. But the night is almost gone. The day is at hand, verse 12. Let us therefore, and here's the attitude we have to have. And they had the best preaching, they had the best preachers, and they had the truth. And you didn't even have to study the Bible when they spoke, because when the apostles spoke, they were speaking the Bible most often through their letters and in the sermons recorded. And they didn't have a whole lot to do but to obey. And he said, let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness. You see, even in the first century, with the Bible being spoken right from the apostles and prophets, and with the Lord being less than a generation removed, and with all the wonders of miracles all about them, already the deeds of darkness were starting to, continuing to dog their heels. He said, let's put on the armor of light. You know, nothing has changed. It's no different in the first century than the 21st century. We have to do the same things. It's a willful, conscious choosing to lay aside the deeds of the flesh and of darkness, and it's a willful, conscious choice to put on the armor of light. And there's really no list of rules, and there's no secret. I, I've had many people come up and say, could you just give us kind of like a, something to do? Tell us how to do it. You know, give us, you know, steps. But you know, as soon as you get a set of steps, then you just start randomly, rotely following them, and you lose sight of the fact that it is a conscious effort day by day, and there's no secret formula. Look at verse 13. Let us behave properly as in the day. And there comes another list of sins. And as I told you, encircling every one of these lists of sins, and this is one of the 21 lists right here, Romans 13:13. 13, 13, is the enablement how not to be involved in those sins. And Paul says, not in carousing, not in drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife, not in jealousy. He just takes a random sampling of, of lust of the flesh and of sin. Verse 14, he puts it well. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. See, it comes down just to a hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, we might have $550 million stealth bombers, but every war this world is going to fight until the Lord comes back is going to end up being hand-to-hand -hand combat. It doesn't matter if you have 16-inch artillery shells coming off from a battleship, every single inch of ground, they have to go in and take. You can bomb to oblivion. Somebody will survive. and You've got to wipe them out one by one in warfare. And that's why the Christian life is called warfare. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on, as it says in verse 12, the armor of light. And it's not a once and for all thing. And it's not a do it once and it's done forever. But it's a constant, willful, daily choice. And in every one of these lists of sin, we find an admonition, which we're just going to briefly look at tonight, a few others, to do something. So let me just show you a few. I want to show you some of these lists, and I want to show you a few of the admonitions. Turn back to Matthew 15. Let's look at how the Lord attacked this thing. 
each one comes from a different slant when they talk about what to do. Matthew 15, verse 19 is the list of sins that our Lord gives. He said, Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. He said, those things don't come from being around that stuff. They come from internalizing that stuff. They come out of the wickedness of the heart. Don't you understand, verse 17, that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But verse 18 is the secret, our Lord says. He says, it has to be a cleansed heart. Verse 18, all things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. That's what defiles you. So what's our Lord say? What's the secret to getting away from verse 19? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and slanders. It's having a, a heart change, a heart cleanse. It's getting a new heart. It starts with salvation. And what we have is a lot of people that are trying to live the Christian life without Christ. So that's something to think about. If you have constant trouble with slander and evil speaking and fornication and thefts and adulteries and evil thoughts the first place to start is where Christ did he said you need a new heart but if there is a new heart then there must be that cleansing of these roots in the heart let's look at what the scriptures say about that turn to Romans 1 because our Lord says the same thing in his second list of sins in Mark 7 but Paul enlarges on this in Romans 1 Romans 1, as you know, is the longest single list of sins with 23 listed there. But if we come to that list from 29 to 31, it's preceded by a lot of truth in how not to have those things take place. So let's look at Romans 1, 4. And from 4 to 25, see what God says we can do to overcome sin in our lives. And instead of going down and trying to get a new book on on how to have the Christian secret of a happy life by Hannah Whitehall Smith, which is a noble book and a marvelous book, let's just look at what the Bible says and what she was writing about because all truth is contained here. And what we need to know is right here. And in Romans 1, 4 it says, Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to what? The Spirit of Holiness. Do you know where victory over sin starts? It starts with the spirit of holiness. God has implanted his very presence within us through his spirit, and that spirit's presence dictates and dominates and causes holiness. You don't need anything else than what you got, your original equipment when you got saved. It's just yielding to that spirit of holiness. Look at verse 5. How does Paul describe salvation? Maybe we need a more perfect view of an understanding of what salvation is rather than hoping for some secret thing to set us free if we're battling with ongoing habitual sin because verse 5 of Romans 1 says, Through whom, that's the spirit of this, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, that's Paul's ministry as he's preaching. And what is his preaching cause? What is salvation? to bring about the obedience of faith. Do you know what salvation is? It's the obedience of faith. If you believe God, if I believe God, if I have received the spirit of holiness, my faith will lead me to obedience. Obedience that comes from faith. Look at verse 12. There are other elements involved. Paul said, here's something that helps me Would you like to know what a super saint, if there were such a thing, would have for his life? That I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. There's something about being around other Christians. And that's why it's so good to spend all the time we can together. That's why the early church had an infectious desire and a passion to be together together that their mutual faith might encourage one another. Look at verse 16, because Paul continues in talking more about, before he even hits this sin list, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. The gospel has a resident power of transformation and of deliverance. 
And what's so amazing to me is when I read the sermons of our Lord and when I read the sermons of the apostles, they never give a list. They never say, okay, you've got to do this and this and come and see me in two days and I'll tell you two more things to do. Jesus said, believe on me, follow me, obey me, let me, my life, live through you. And he doesn't bring it down to bite-sized pieces. He just says, take all of me and let my spirit work through you. And that's why it's something individual that he mediates through his spirit's power to let the power of the gospel flow through us to transform us. But look at verse 17. For it's the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And I've told you this so many times. By whose faith? By the faith that we can conjure up ourselves? No. No, not at all. Christ said in Acts 26, 18, it's the faith that is in him that he has given to us. For by grace we've been saved through faith. And even that's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. It's receiving from Him all that we need to live. Look at verse 18. Another thing Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And where does ungodliness and unrighteousness come from? From those that hold or suppress the truth. You know what? If you want to look for secrets in the Bible to victorious living, here's one in verse 18. It's letting truth act. It's not holding it down. If it's true, then live by it. Don't suppress it. Don't hold it down. I think about this in my life. Every time I read the Bible, and, and, and the more times I read it through, the more I see the Word of God, and I have to say I can't be disobedient to anything that I see. And that must be in all of our lives, and there must be that constant exposure to the mind of God revealed in His Word. And when we come across something that is in God's Word, don't hold it down. Or rather, let it come forth, the truth in our lives. Verse 21 says, Honor God as God. Honor Him for who He is. They fell into sin because they were re unwilling and they refused to honor Him for who He was. Verse 25 says, Keep the truth. Don't exchange it. Don't give it up for something else. Even for something as good as somebody else's great thoughts or even good applications, don't ever give up the truth. A lot of people have trouble distinguishing between truth and someone's good ideas or thoughts. That's why each of us must examine the Scriptures ourselves. Because it says there is no secret teacher in this world. We all have the anointing of God. Some are called to be teaching shepherds, but all of us have the anointing to understand the mind of God and His Word. Well, let's look at another sin list real quick. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. Many of you have heard this list often in your lives, I'm sure. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 list off a whole bunch of gross sins. I'll read them to you. Or do you not know that the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Fornicators won't inherit it. Idolaters won't inherit it. Adulterers won't. Effeminate won't. The homosexuals won't. Thieves won't. Covetous. Drunkards. Revilers. Swindlers. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's an awful list. That's pretty blunt. But look at verse 11. Because Paul talks about how not to be those things. And in a few weeks, I'm going to be preaching about gays, AIDS, and God. And we're going to talk about that whole aspect of our society. But what's amazing about it is that Paul, talking to a group of people that had those problems, doesn't single out any one of them to say that's the worst. I think that Christians were a little guilty sometimes of, of really thinking that, that one aberration in the sexual realm is the worst. And others aren't so bad, and I must say I've been guilty of that myself until I started reading what Paul said. And he puts side by side fornicators, and that's, you know, going a little too far on a date. You know, we call it, well, a little premarital stuff. God calls it fornication. He puts those side by side with idolaters, which he also calls covetousness. That's the longing for having something and worshiping it to the point of devoting our life to it apart from God's word. 
adulterers, and the Lord said, that's whether you do it or whether you think it. And side by side with that, he puts effeminate, or the, that's the uh, passive member of sodomy, and homosexuals are the <coughs> active or the abusers themselves. He puts right beside that the thieves, and that's stealing from the government or stealing from your employer or just breaking into somebody's house and stealing. The thieves, the revilers, the swindlers. He puts them all side by side. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say thieves and covetous and fornicators and the homosexuals way up here. He puts them all on the same par and he says this in verse 11, such were some of you. But here's the hope, and here's the way for victorious Christian living. He said, but you're washed. What's amazing is in the first century, they looked for supernatural transformation. We look for long-term rehabilitation. We say, oh, they've got to get in this long-term program to get you know, reprogrammed. No, God says that you can be in a moment instantly washed. He says that we can be sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of the Lord. We can be washed, we can be sanctified, we can be justified. What else, Paul? We'll look down to verse 18. There has to be something that takes place alongside of that. Look at verse 18. Flee immorality. He says we have to be active in all this. Look at verse 17. Back up one. But he who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. I like this one. I like the translation that word one man put. He said, be glued to the Lord. That word join speaks of a, of a complete being knit close together. He said, be glued to the Lord. I know some people, I was just reading in the USA Today this week, that most Americans are glued to their television seven hours a day. And they wonder why they are having trouble with inordinate affections. Can you imagine watching seven hours of television with the advertisements that are on? With just the previews of the next week's shows of murder, of adultery, of fornication, of blasphemy, of easy living, of a kind of a type of lifestyle that thinks that this is all we have to live for, we're going to live for ourselves. It doesn't say be glued to the television, it says be glued himself to the Lord. Let's look at another sin list, Galatians 5, because all these are basically talking about the same thing. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, is quite a list of sins, but before that list is ever even written, what does Paul say in 16, 17, and 18? He says, walk in the Spirit, follow the Spirit, and let the Spirit war against the lusts of our flesh. We know all these things, but I ask you, are we doing them? Are we saying, Lord, I want to be glued to you. I want to not suppress truth in my life. Expose me to your word. Let me obey it. Let me walk in the Spirit. Let me follow the Spirit where he leads. Let the Spirit war through me. Here's another one. Turn beyond Galatians and past Ephesians. We'll skip that list in there and look at Colossians 3. This is another great example of how a categorical list of prohibitions against sin is preceded by four verses of how not to be involved in those things. I like that. Colossians 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 have a, a horrendous list of sins. It says immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, idolatry. On these things, the wrath of God will come. In verse 8, put them aside anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. But how do you start out that chapter? Look at verse 1. If then you've been raised up with Christ, I'd prefer to make that a since. If you want to look at the construction, you could easily say since you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. That's an imperative. Keep seeking them where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Here's another one. Here's a command. Set your mind on the things above. That means don't be immersed in, in looking at, at the things of this earth. That means there are certain magazines. That means there's 
much of the media that we must not spend time with. Just the cartoon shows nowadays, it's just getting incredible. It's getting so, there's, there are only about two shows on television that, that we'll let John watch, Little John, without us being there to turn the channels. If it's not a cultic, it's, it's mocking something or someone. Unless you can watch something from the 50s or 60s, there's hardly anything left to watch these days. It's to set our minds on things above. When someone comes and someone says, I'm battling with sin, it's very easy to tell where, where it started. The eye gates are flooded. The ears are flooded. In every sensory method that God has given us to perceive the outside world, they're plugged with things on the earth, as verse 2 says. Why should we look above? Verse 3, we've died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. That's where we are. We're dead to this world and to sin and to passions and to lust, and we're hidden with Christ and God. Why don't we look in things above and be reminded of that? Verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then we'll be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, verse 5, consider the members of our earthly body dead. And then verse 8, put them aside. On and on we could go through these sin lists. Also, we could share verses we know so well. James 4, 7 says, just resist the devil. There's an active participation. Titus 2 says, say no to sin. Deny it. 1 Peter 1, says, purify our souls in obeying the truth. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4 says, abstain. Ellicott, the Greek commentator, puts it this way, hold yourself from it. And God says there's nothing that's ever going to confront us but such as is normal to humanity. And with every confrontation and every glaring drawing towards sin, there's the open door and God's invitation for us to come and find victory. I guess what's most important is for us to see that victory is a daily struggle. We must learn to regard our Christian life as a race. 1 Corinthians 9.24 we have to see it as combat in the arena of faith, Philippians 3.14 and Hebrews 12.14. We have to learn to say, I therefore so run, 1 Corinthians 9.26. We have to say, I won't count my life dear to myself that I can finish the course that God laid out for me, as Paul did in Acts 20.24. 2 Timothy 4.7, he says, I finished the the pathway, the course that God has laid out for me.